Thank you very much. Good evening and good Earth Day. I am Mary Hembrow Snyder, coordinator of tonight's event. And I would ask you, first of all, please take a moment to turn off your cell phones. Now, on behalf of President Kathleen Getz and the entire Mercyhurst community, Falta Acharda, a Gaelic phrase which means welcome friends. And welcome friends to our very special evening ahead featuring Dr. Mary McAleese and Sister Joan Chittister. This evening's conversation is the fifth in the series of lectures and conversations made possible since 2014 by the exceptional generosity and support of the adult children of the late Helen Loblens Boyle, a 1934 graduate of Mercyhurst and a longtime friend of Sister Joan Chittister. While most of you in the audience are familiar with who Sister Joan is, some of you may not be, especially if you're students. Um, so here, in my humble opinion, are the four most important things you should know about Sister Joan. Sister Joan has been a dedicated Benedictine sister of Erie for almost 70 years. Throughout those years, she has immersed herself in the scriptures, prayerful reflection on those scriptures, and in the current issues of the day, especially those concerned with religion and Roman Catholicism in particular. Second, for at least 60 years, Sister Joan has been a courageous prophetic voice for the poor, for children, for immigrants, and in particular, for justice and equality for women in both church and society. Third, Sister Joan has written more than 60 books. Timely and challenging explorations regarding the spiritual journey, adult faith, monasticism, nonviolence, institutional misogyny, sexism, racism, and more. Her most recently published book is titled The Monastic Heart, 50 Simple Practices for a Contemplative and Fulfilling Life. Finally, Sister Joan is a Mercyhurst alum. She graduated in 1962 with a BA in English. Thereafter, she achieved an MA in Communication Arts from the University of Notre Dame and a PhD in speech communication theory from Penn State. Surely then, you can appreciate why she is Mercy Hearst's most famous alum, as well as one of the most articulate social analysts and influential religious leaders in our world today. Our esteemed guest in conversation tonight with Sister Joan is Dr. Mary McAleese. Dr. McAleese was president of Ireland from 1997 until 2011. She was the first president to come from Northern Ireland. Born in Belfast in 1951, the eldest of nine children, she grew up in Ardoin, a sectarian flashpoint area of the city and experienced firsthand the violence of the troubles. The theme of her presidency was building bridges and her work for peace and reconciliation culminated in the historic state visit to Ireland by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II in 2011. A barrister and journalist by training, Dr. McAleese was Reed Professor of Criminal Law, Criminology, and Penology at Trinity College Dublin, Director of the Institute of Professional Legal Studies, 
and the first female pro vice chancellor at the Queen's University of Belfast. For many years prior to her election as president of Ireland, she was involved in social justice campaigning. Among other commitments, she was a co-founder of Belfast Women's Aid, the Campaign for Homosexual Law Reform, as well as the Irish Commission for Prisoners Overseas. Dr. McAleese is the author of several books, the latest titled, Here's the Story, a memoir written in 2020. She has a licentiate and doctorate in Latin Catholic Church Canon Law from the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome. Her current area of research is children's rights in canon law and intellectual rights and freedoms in the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Dr. McAleese and her husband Martin have three adult children and two grandsons. Currently, she is the Chancellor of the University of Dublin Trinity College, Chair of the Ansari Institute at the University of Notre Dame, a Professor of Children, Law and Religion at the University of Glasgow, and a Canon of Christ Church Cathedral in Dublin. Please give a warm Mercyhurst welcome to Sister Joan Chittister and Dr. Mary McAleese. Erie always shows up. <laughs> and on an Irish night, they come twice as often. <laughs> we love you, Mary. I want to uh, take this opportunity simply to give you a, a frame before we begin our conversation. The first part of the frame is a story from the Sufis about a pilgrim Sufi who lost his treasure on the way to the holy day at the mosque. He sank to the dirt in the top of the day with the heat beating down, and he wailed over and over again, I've lost my treasure, my treasure is gone, I've lost my treasure. The pilgrims on their way to the holy day were good people, and they couldn't just leave the guy alone there, so they sank down in the dust beside him, and they began to dug too. And finally, in the, with the sun is high and the heat is terrible, finally one of the wise pilgrims stopped the digging and said, Sufi, are, are, are you sure you lost your treasure here? And the Sufi said, no, 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 I, I didn't lose my treasure here. I lost my treasure over there on the other side of the mountain. And the pilgrim said, oh, Sufi, if you know that you didn't lose your treasure here, why in the name of Allah are you looking here? And Sufi said, because there's more light here. <laughs> we do the same thing. We do it regularly. We find our answers where there is not enough light, where people don't want to discuss the issues, they simply want to impose the, the behavior. They, we need to learn to look where the light is shining. We're bringing you a real shining light tonight. This Madam Past President of Ireland, Mary McAleese, is now a chancellor from Trinity College in Dublin and a professor of children, law, and religion from Glasgow in Scotland. And you know that because Mary already told you that. But the fact of the matter, what you have to understand is, 
when you leave a presidency and nobody will let you go anywhere except to stay in the system because we trust you and we know you and we know you're being honest and you are a godly light. Thank yourselves for this night and this woman. The second frame for our listening tonight comes from Teilhard de Chardin, the paleontologist and philosopher who writes, the only task worthy of our efforts is to construct the future. And I want to talk to you about how you are sitting in the middle of a, of a constructed future, because I want to talk to you about the third woman. The third woman and her family are really what has brought us here tonight. Helen Boyle, another Irish woman who was kind enough to me to have been my own mother, was special. Helen did not define her life by collecting old dogmas. On the contrary, Helen was a woman with a passion for truth, respect for new questions, and a soul full of wisdom that she passed on to her children in order that they might seed in their day what we need to know in another. It's her children who are sponsoring this Helen Boyle lesson and this Joan Chittister conversation. I'm asking the Boyle family, would you please stand up wherever you are? And I thank this audience for recognizing that with me. And now the fireworks begin. <laughs> uh, we'll do the regular Chittister format. Uh, we have a conversation set up around four questions or four issues. Uh, I will keep time of around 13 to 15 minutes on each of those separate issues. And at the end, uh, one, two, three, or four of you will be asked if you would like to ask your own question of, of either of us at the end of the stay. So, Mary. This is a woman who lived through the troubles in Ireland, that terrible tension and separation between Protestant Ireland and Catholic Ireland. She will tell you that she lived in a village, uh, in a house, a Catholic house between two Protestant houses, and they never saw any difference at all until politics took over heart and, and uh, immersed this little country in god-awful pain and fear, 30 years of violence. So here's my question, Mary. I'm, I'm, I'm Irish bred, most of the city knows that, but I'm American. I live in this country, in this political system, and I tell you I'm worried. We don't have uh, shooters in the street. We don't have a UDF or an IRA. We don't have private militias on the east side of town fighting other private militias on the west side of town in Erie, Pennsylvania, but I'll tell you what we do have. We have the most evil polarization I have ever known in American history since the Civil War. It is grounded in nothing. It is a wall of separation, which in all my childhood years in Erie, I never dreamed was possible. I taught history to high school kids and told them this couldn't happen. We had checks and balances. What we don't have now, in my opinion, is a government, a parliamentary, a congressional commitment to the common good. We have two equally defiant and defective political systems who are in search of power rather than 
in the needs of the people. Mary, tell us. <laughs> tell us in the most serious and sincere, sincere way uh, what, 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 you, what you dealt with as people in the streets and, and bodies and on, the, on, the, on the roads, what we are dealing with is exclusion and uh, defiance and the refusal to be our best American. What would you do, having gone, uh, you were not only in it, uh, she has a 353-page book. I read every word of it out loud. And I'll tell you, this woman led that country through that division. First of all, name some things you did and tell me what you think that we should be doing in this country to bring ourselves back to our best selves. Thank you for asking me such a really simple question. <laughs> It's just a great way to start the evening. <laughs> Typical Joan, of course, um, going right to the heart of it. And thanks for asking me to be here. Thank you all for being here. Um, the word wall came up in your description of current American politics. Well, welcome to my world. If I was to take you to the place, I, I grew up in Belfast, as you heard, in a place called Ardoin, um, uh, North Belfast. And if I was to take you there today, and drive up the road that I lived on and the road from which my family was forcibly ejected by machine gun fire. Um, all along that road, which is a major artery from the city center to the airport, there is an eight foot brick wall on one side of that road all the way up through my parish. And that wall is designed for one thing and one thing only, and that is to stop Catholics and Protestants from engaging with each other in ways that are not healthy. Uh, because of course there has been a long history of conflict leading to violence. That particular parish has the highest incidence of sectarian murders in all of Ireland. So that's today. That's after the Good Friday Agreement. That's after 25 years of peace building. It's still there. Why? Because we haven't still done what you need to do here, which is to lower those walls through dialogue. Dialogue that is respectful, dialogue that is not malice laden, dialogue that is designed to try and provoke and promote the common good. Rather than focusing on difference, rather than focusing on the petty vanities of difference, because many of these differences are relatively modest when you put them together. I mean, I'm talking about Northern Ireland, where I grew up, Belfast, where I grew up, has more church steeples than you could imagine. These are a Christian people, Catholic and Protestant. So they've all read the same, more or less the same Bible. They probably have come to the conclusion they believe in different gods, because like there's two different gods when I was growing up. There was the God who believed that Northern Ireland wanted to be Protestant in perpetuity and was prepared to exclude Catholics from everything, you know, from voting, from housing, from jobs. Um, and then there was the other God, the Catholic God, who wanted Ireland to be for the Irish, but who also didn't want women to be involved in decision-making about that Ireland. And I think I was fortunate that growing up, I just thought the whole lot of them were ridiculous. I thought they were all ridiculous and stupid because the default position always seemed to be exclusion. Don't talk to one another. Don't dare stand in each other's footsteps. I was lucky, I grew up in a Protestant area, um, mainly because my, my, my mother and father were country people who came to Belfast and really weren't terribly aware of the foundational politics that embedded was this history of sectarian pogroms. And so they were the first Catholics to buy a house in the street that I lived in and grew up in. And um, it was great because a lot of the neighbors didn't talk to us. Some of the neighbors wouldn't let their kids play with us, but lots of other neighbors did and became great friends. And so I got to see the panoply 
of, you know, of Protestantism. All the Catholics went to the one church. The Protestants all scattered in different directions on a Sunday to a whole, you know, kaleidoscope of churches. And that was a great education to me. Um, also, I realized that not all of them had the same opinions. But, but um, the politics of, the, the, if you like, what history had conferred on us was this sort of almost this black and white rhetoric hadn't been given the tools of dialogue and the tools of discussion, and I think that's what we need to work on. I, I want actually, you to, yeah, I want George you to do Mitchell more with that. Came, yeah, George yeah. Mitchell, you remember him? Yes, I Who see. came to Ireland, he actually, Senator George Mitchell, taught us in Ireland, in Northern Ireland, how to speak respectfully to one another, mm -hmm. not to always go into a room to discuss something and instantly spark into breakdown. Yeah, yeah. So right. actually, we learned that from so George So tell me Mitchell. what it was, what they learned. That's how we, we learned. He painstakingly, when he was um, when he came to Ireland as President Clinton's representative, and helped to formulate the structure that gave us eventually an international peace treaty. The first thing he did was to teach us to speak respectfully to one another. That took several years, and people began to realise just simply from that witness that if you speak respectfully, you can hope to stay in the room together. If you speak out of malice or hatred or disrespect, people, it's neuralgic. Describe people are raw, that for they walk me. Away. Describe speaking respectfully. Well, in his case, it was the insistence on dealing with issues and not personality, on dealing with common ground and not the ground that separated, constantly asking us, provoking us to see where there was common purpose and where we could compromise. Also, I think, appealing to us that if, as most of us said, we wanted peace, were we prepared to invest in peace, which meant compromising? And it's really where I learned the lesson that, you know, that we were all 100% people. We wanted 100% of everything. We wanted everything our way. Um, and I learned from him that 90% of something is better than 100% of nothing. Because 100% of nothing is what we had when we did not lower those walls and engage in dialogue. So when, when I was elected president of the Republic of Ireland, um, where I didn't have a vote, incidentally, I mean, I was working and living in Northern Ireland when I was elected to the presidency of Ireland. And now so wait I, I, I wait, did. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Explain that? Yeah, I, you, there you, you go now. You yeah. got the job and you didn't have the vote? I didn't have a vote and I didn't live there. Well, I had done in the past. I had worked in Trinity College. I had worked in Irish television. But I was from Belfast and had gone back to live in Northern Ireland. But under the Irish Constitution, if you're born on the island of Ireland, which I was, <laughs> uh, thankfully, uh, you're entitled to stand as president. So I did. And mercifully, even though I'm from a very big family, because I'm, I'm one of nine, I'm the oldest of nine kids, my mum and her siblings have 11 children, have 60 children between them. They have, uh, my mother was one of 11. And my family thought they had to increase, multiply, and fill the earth entirely by themselves. <laughs> and, and not one of them had a blessed vote, because they were all in the north. Um, I, I could have won the election easily if they'd all had votes. Um, <laughs> Uh, I could have stayed home and not had to, you know, not had to go and campaign. But anyway, that didn't, that part didn't work for me. But and I, I won the election, thankfully. And but say I didn't, I didn't have a vote. But I was always very grateful because I brought to the presidency the knowledge of someone who lived in a deeply affected sectarian um, quagmire. Yeah. And where the default position was exclusion, but also paramilitarism. A long, long, long history of defaulting to violence, actual physical violence. And next door, um, on, the, on the road that I lived on, um, one of the families that we were very, very friendly with, um, their daughter, their eldest daughter, and one of my sisters, my sister was her bridesmaid, that's how close we were, in and out of each other's houses. And yet her brother um, joined a, a Protestant loyalist paramilitary group and went out one night and murdered four random Catholics in retaliation for um, a killing a few days earlier by, I think for the Brighton bombing actually, or for a ca killing carried out by the IRA. That's the world we lived in. If a Catholic was killed today, you knew a Protestant would be killed tomorrow. It was tit for tat and it was, as John Hume used to say, you know, 
that, you know, that where, where you know, where it was an eye for an eye, everybody ended up blind. Um, so my view was God gave me some kind of spirit that said, this is just irredeemably stupid and it's getting us nowhere. And not only is it getting us nowhere, but it's offensive to the gospel that we all purport to believe in. And if I was to believe that gospel, that love could conquer all, then I better live it and try it. So that's what we did on the day that I was elected and went into the house of the president in the center of uh, in, in, uh, Dublin, a beautiful old house that incidentally had been the house of the governor's general and the Lord's lieutenant of Ireland. So not be loved by the people who had invested in Irish freedom because it was associated with British colonialism and imperialism. And there had been a plan to knock that house down when independence happened. But anyway, they didn't knock it down. And now it's become very beloved of the people because it's become the heart yeah, yeah, of yeah. this new Ireland. Anyway, when we walked into it that day, going through the door, my husband, Martin, who's somewhere in the audience there, um, I said to him as we went through the door, you know, we were there for seven years, we thought. We ended up being there for 14. And I said to him, you know, at the end of this time, we should know if the great commandment to love one another works, because that's what we're going to try and do. So we outreached to all the people who over their dead bodies would ever talk to an Irish president, come to Dublin, go to the house of the president. And it was a, you know, Martin sat on the phone, um, you know, day in, day out, talking to all my old Protestant friends and neighbors. But how did and you that's get where we it? started. That's where we in started. Ameri in American uh, newspapers, we, we saw the leadership in Ireland and we saw the kind of cemented positions that we're experiencing right now. Mm. You can take a bill into Congress and you, and you know we're, we're in a state, Mary, where we are being governed by uh, a plus or minus one. Mm. 49 votes won't do this, 50 will change the, the country. So the whole notion of, of uh, bringing people together and saying, if we pass a bill like this, what will it do to the West? What will it do to the South? What will it do to the East? What will it do to the North? We don't do that anymore. We don't do that. We push for the plus uh, uh, one or, or, or minus two. Now that's, that's frightening me as a person. I see that as uh, the, the crucible and the cutting edge of the loss of democracy. But you see, you're talking to someone who's come from, you know, um, <laughs> the biggest numbers game imaginable, in, in, in particularly in Northern Ireland, is the numbers game between Catholic and Protestant, uh, which is currently uh, being worked out in a way that most Protestants who were regarded as pro-British and unionist, uh, whereas Catholics were regarded as Irish and pro-Irish unity and anti-partition, the partitioning of Ireland, we are now actually watching that numbers game shifting the demography of Ireland. And as it does, we're seeing all these tensions arising uh, that we have yet to resolve. I mean, I don't know how a future generation is gonna do it, but in this present moment, we've gotta try and help them to seed the ground, to make sure that all the stuff from the past doesn't just get you know, reseeded in the present to yeah. come up again as weeds in the future. But for example, at the moment, <coughs> when I was growing up in Northern Ireland, Catholics were 33% of the population. Why? Because that's how it had been designed. It had been designed to create a small Catholic minority, a huge Protestant majority, and so you heard the epithets, a Protestant parliament for a Protestant people. Um, but, you see, they, they reckoned without families like my mother. Um, and, you know, the increased multiply and fill the earth. And here we are now, and the Catholic population is, uh, in the next election, as, we'll as we will see, um, will be pretty much um, heading towards being a majority. And when that happens, um, and we're probably likely to see there's an election coming in May now, and certainly will probably translate into a voting majority um, for uh, nationalists, Irish so-called Catholic nationalists. And that's going to be very hard for a Protestant population, which came out of planter stock four or 500 years ago, um, you know, people who were brought from Scotland and England and who took land from the native Irish, that didn't go down too well. Memory's still there, even though it was 400 years ago. Um, they had a, 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 
a mentality of protecting. They also had a mentality of entitlement. You know, they had done the king's work and this was their reward. The Irish saw that as colonialism, imperialism, theft, graft, greed. And so all those, all those tensions are still there. And Ulster Unionists, Protestant Unionists now in Northern Ireland are facing a scenario where th the worst scenario they could have imagined back at the foundation of the state where the Protestant population will be soon a voting minority. And that's going to test our credentials as people who have said through the Good Friday Agreement that we wanted to focus on a shared future. Do we really? Are we prepared for that shared future? Are we prepared to engage with one another? We're being tested okay. every day, okay. every day. Who, who are you talking to? I mean, uh, my, well, Martin, I, for example, he talks all the time to people that nobody else will talk to who are the loyalist paramilitaries. Nobody wants to talk to paramilitaries. And yet, if you want paramilitaries to think differently, then they've got to, ex they've got to exit their echo chamber. Yeah. And that means they've got to hear other stuff. So okay. Martin, who grew up in an area um, that was dominated by Protestant loyalist paramilitaries, I mean, he couldn't, you know, from he was a tiny lad, he couldn't go to the shops to buy, a, you know, a yeah. pound of butter without putting his life at risk. Yeah. Um, so from thugs, uh, but then, you know, God works in mysterious ways because when, when, we, when I came into office, he was able to go to those same Protestant loyalists and talk to them on okay. their own terms because right. he knew every bit of their geography, every bit of their landscape, and little by little, he built trust with them. Okay, this is important, very important, because uh, I would argue that we can't, I was going to ask you, uh, with this respectful language. Who's in the room for those conversations? Don't, don't name names. Tell me what kind of people are brought together to start that respectful language. At the very beginning, we started with the people who were willing to come. Um, ah, even, no matter you, how tentatively. So you didn't, you didn't start with your, with your representative? Gosh, you no. Huh? Gosh, no. No, no, no. No. I mean, it'd be like to start, you know, starting church reform with the Turia. Okay. Wh wh why would you bother? Why would you bother? No, we went straight to the people of God. You're right. And um, we went straight to people who nobody ever had asked to come and talk about anything, uh, and yet whose lives and whose actions were causing a lot of the a lot of the problems. So we started with um, uh, with people that we knew, um, who um, we believed would be helpful. So Martin sat on the phone, for example, I mean, we ate for Ireland for seven, four, practically 14 years. We had lunches, we had dinners, we had you know, afternoon teas, we had morning coffees. And one of the things we didn't do was talk politics at first. We talked children, holidays, at the weather, um, anything at the beginning to create a platform of a shared memory where we had been respectful of one another and interested in each other and where we hadn't walked away as enemies. But, but you started calling these different Correct. groups together, together. And, and there and wasn't anything that your elected um, body could do to stop that. Thank God, no. Right. No, there wasn't. And that's what we did. And then in each group, we would, we would talk after every lunch, dinner, whatever, and say, you know, who came across as somebody who was really committed to this? And Martin would then phone them and say, will you come back and bring 10 of your friends? And, and if there are people that you phone who say, I wouldn't go there in a fit, keep their names, keep their addresses and telephone numbers. And over the course of the years, we went back to them. And eventually, everybody came. And that was the most remarkable thing, that the most reluctant, the most recalcitrant people at the beginning, after seven years, after 14 years, were more than willing. And here's the thing, we never ever did it for photo opportunities. People are damn cynical, you know, about politicians and photo opportunities. And they're also rightly cynical about, you know, one-off events, um, you know, where you come, you get the photograph, you're never seen again. We, we, were, about fe we were about friendship building. And I kept making the point to them, I don't want to turn you into me. I don't want to turn you into somebody who has my politics, my faith. I'm not evangelizing here, but I do want to be a good neighbor. And I think good neighborliness allows you to work for the common good across all sorts of chasms and gaps and differences. Okay, and that's Mary, what we worked on. You, you make your point. Um, the, you, you will be driven to Washington, D.C. tomorrow. <laughs> it, will be an, it will be another.
another seven to 14 year, <laughs> trust me. Okay, Mary, let's talk about something else. Um, why in God's name, coming out of work that important and that meaningful and that exciting, why in God's name would you leave the presidency to study canon law? <laughs> well, first of all, I had to leave the presidency because I had done yeah. two terms. Yeah. And uh, that was 14 years, incidentally, in Irish you know, money. And um, so I, 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 there was no, I couldn't run for a third term. So that was fine. I had to do something else. And I also felt it was important to get offside. I'd been there a long time and you know, let the new yeah. president you know, just get on with it. And so, um, but, but I- But canon law? Well, I, I already had, <laughs> I know, but I belong to it. Let me go back to my days in Belfast. Um, I, as I mentioned, I, you know, I'm Catholic growing up in a Protestant autocracy um, where Catholics are oppressed and are second class citizens. And so, I be, and others around me in my parish joined paramilitary organizations. And, um, but, and nobody was interested in getting involved in politics because politics were too divisive. But something in me was attracted to the law because many of the laws helped and assisted the exclusion of Catholics. They helped and assisted ah. the creation of an unequal and oppressive and um, divided community. Yeah. And I thought, well, maybe there is some, maybe if the law can be helped to, to change, to modify, to adapt. It can be made to work for all the people, which is why I became a lawyer, and then a civil lawyer initially. And then um, I was also a woman in the Catholic Church. And um, so I eventually kind of figured that there were a lot of things that um, I wasn't happy about uh, in terms of my church governance and doctrine and dogma and such. And I also knew that just as I had had no voice as a Catholic in the politics of Northern Ireland, I had no voice in my church. Uh, in the North, it was everything about Catholics, but without them. And in the church, it was everything about us, but without us. So I kind of figured there's something wrong here. I knew it had a universal legal structure called canon law. And I figured if I wanted to know, particularly if I wanted to talk about it, and if I wanted to critique it, I would need to have the credentials. You know, I'd need to have the academic credentials. And so um, I was still relatively young leaving, mm -hmm. leaving office, mm -hmm. um, relatively young, um, uh, back in 2011. And I already had a master's degree in canon law, which I did while I was president, <laughs> incidentally. So, um, and um, I studied, that was my, you know, that was my release in the evening. Um, when Explain canon law. Well, well I mean, who, who's, do you want? Yeah. Seriously? Yeah. Mother of the divine, where are you getting these tough questions <laughs> from? Explain canon. Right. I mean, well, wow. what, what good will canon law do any of us? Well, that was my problem. Okay. Uh, because canon law, to my mind, has been really insufficiently critiqued. C civil lawyers like me knew nothing about canon law. Canon law knows, canon lawyers mostly know nothing about civil law. Theologians know nothing about canon law. And yet they all work in parallel, well, actually not even in parallel tracks, but in tracks that, because parallel tracks do eventually meet somewhere, I think in the law of physics, but these guys never meet. And that's dangerous, and they don't understand each other. Um, and I felt a very strong need to understand canon law. The universal law of the Catholic Church impacts 1.2 billion people in the world. You know, one in six people are members of the Latin Catholic Church. So um, I figured, really from first principles, that there is something, there's something wrong with the, with, the, with the structure of canon law. That's, for example, take a very simple thing. Um, I grew up as a human rights lawyer, uh, learning about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And I had, I was, I loved that concept that, that, um, that human dignity demands that you and I as human beings have the right to freedom of conscience, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, freedom of opinion, freedom of belief, freedom of religion, freedom to change religion. And then I thought, yeah, that's great. And and where did those rights all come from? Well, some people be believe they simply come from the natural law, but if you're a person of faith, you believe these were given to you. These are the gift of God. That's what God gave us. He gave us all these wonderful freedoms and the grace to live with these freedoms and to develop them and to do good things with them. And then I started to look at canon law and discovered, uh, 
yeah, hang on a wee minute. Do you see that freedom of speech thing and freedom of conscience and freedom of opinion? You don't have that in canon law because canon law teaches that by virtue of our baptismal promises when we became Catholic, we conceded to the church those rights. And so we are obliged by our baptismal promises. We're obliged to be um, obedient to the magisterium. Well, like, there was a whole load of stuff that the magisterium, like the, the bishops taught, that I really had difficulty with. A whole load of stuff. And I'm thinking, well, I don't really want to be obedient to that. And why should I be obedient? Just because I'm a member of the church. And then I started to explore how I became a member of the church. Well, that happened when I was two weeks old. So there's a whole kind of consent thing going on there that was absent. There's a whole lot of stuff. And I'm saying, how did I, what did I promise? I was two weeks old when I made a promise that I'm held to for life. And the lawyer in me kicked in and said, come on now, lads, this is not, no, you've got to look at this again. This is wickedly silly stuff now, particularly in the light of our understanding of human rights. And our church, my church, your church, we really have not dealt with the impact of these fundamental rights, our understanding of fundamental intellectual rights in the light of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and in the light of canon law. Canon law just hasn't absorbed that thinking. And it's ironic because if you take, you know, the, 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 the Pope of the day was deeply implicated, as indeed was the United States of America, in drawing up the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. You know, the Pope of the day wrote to Eleanor Roosevelt and suggested it, suggested a declaration. Um, similarly with the Convention on the Rights of the Child, it was the Catholic Church was right in there helping with the travel preparatoire. But that's part of a mindset that is centuries old, where the church sees itself as, it was appropriate, I can't remember which UN Secretary General described it as the pulpit of the world, where it talks out to the world with strong moral authority and um, preaches to the world and tries to persuade the world, but, but never turns the spotlight back internally into its own canon law world, its own world of dogma and doctrine to see do they match up to things like the fundamental freedoms well, that I've just spoken okay, of. Stop there for now because I, I, um, I've spent a good part of the useless part of my life struggling with the concept of infant baptism. Yeah. And of the 14 rites in the Catholic Church, I think that only 11 require infant baptism. And I've never been able to understand infant baptism. So I simply, when I'm teaching, I simply say to audiences or, or uh, students, there's only one thing I want you to know. Infant baptism is a beautiful ritual. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is a phenomenal impact on the commitment of, of this child and this family to this tradition and, and, and this awareness of God. Having said all that, I also promise you that if you were baptized as an infant, I believe that every single one of us go back to that baptismal font as an adult. And we hear the voice inside of us saying, do you believe? Correct. And I believe Which that we that don't is actually a, do. That, that's right. But that most, most adult Catholics, and I would also say Christians, you know, I, there's a lot of adult baptism going on in the Christian tradition, not just mm. Roman Catholic. But it, I, I really, I believe that those moments, churches give practically no support to the adult who is struggling as alone and without uh, uh, godparents next to them to decide whether, how do I decide? You see, that's the point that I'm trying to make. I, I think infant baptism is beautiful. I have no problem with the theology of infant baptism. I have a big problem with the juridic side of it. The, the theological side, you know, ending original sin, opening up to salvation, becoming incorporated into the body of Christ, knowing that God's grace is going to accompany you. Beautiful. I think that's lovely. And I would wish that and did wish that and offered that to my children. 
the bit that gets me is the fact that the canon lawyers are standing right beside the baptismal font with a contract that says, right, now you've promised, now you're a member for life, you can never escape, and now the relationship between you and the church is not based on your faith in God, your belief in God, but on obligation. Not a voluntary commitment, but obligation. And I think that catechesis of obligation that we sit on today is, particularly in the Western world where we're educated about rights, it doesn't fit any longer. We need to move to that very thing yeah. that you've talked about, that, that catechesis of voluntarism. That's right. And, and see, then you, you leave a whole body of people feeling guilty in their 40s because all of a sudden they can't make the, they can't make the picture go together. So it must be me. I've lost my faith. And I would argue that's when your faith begins. It kicks in. Because and it needs then the Christian community. It needs the community to support it. Now the church says that in a beautiful way in infant baptism. Here you are. Here is your community. You'll be fine. Everything is wonderful. We're going to help you. But when they need help most, we Again. have nothing There's built nothing. in mm -hmm. that says, don't be surprised if you aren't feeling guilty, aren't feeling out of it, aren't feeling beyond it, mm -hmm. aren't feeling that it's useless. And I'm, I'm simply saying, I don't, uh, I, 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 some people just simply say they don't believe in infant baptism. I won't say that I don't oh, no. believe in it, but I say it's only the beginning and that the, what the church needs is a catechesis of adulthood because your questions then are different. And it's a catechesis that prepares you to take responsibility for your own faith, uh, that yeah. allows you to engage with faith as a mature and believing person, not as somebody who passively says, I must obey. You see, that, that model belonged to an imperial church. It belonged to a church just like many empires relied on conscripts whom they were, they issued a law, the conscripts did what they were told. Um, now it doesn't suit the kind of world we live in where we understand our rights and our, and our capabilities differently and where we want to have a mature relationship yes. with religion. But I think I, I wouldn't stop infant baptism at all. I think infant baptism is beautiful because I love the idea of the grace accompanying you, yeah, you know, yes, from, all, you know yes. from childhood. That's a very beautiful thing. I also think that we've missed a few tricks here. For um, I don't know if any of you have seen the film um, Mary Queen of Scots, the more recent uh, version of Mary Queen of Scots with Saoirse Ronan, the Irish actress in it, um, acting as Mary Queen of Scots. And anyway, I went to see it with my kids. We occasionally go to the cinema together and we're, we're strung out in the lower you know, we're second row of seats and up comes, like they, they were about three or four years making this blessed film and it's based on a really very good academic study of Mary Queen of Scots. Anyway, the first thing that comes up on the, on the screen is a piece of text which says, Mary Queen of Scots was born a Catholic. <gasps> I imploded immediately. <laughs> And I go, that is theologically, canonically, and every other way, just nonsense. That is not possible. You can't be born a Catholic. And from the far end of the row, my son Justin shouts, Mom, we're all theologically literate in this row. Would you shut up and let us watch the film? But I, I couldn't do a bit of good the whole film. I was thinking, how could they make it and be so silly? We're not born Catholic. What makes us Catholic is baptism. Now, here's the rub. In between that being born and being, becoming Catholic, our church currently teaches, and this I find absolutely unacceptable in a church that has made such a big ding-dong um, about protecting the right to life of the child in the womb. Um, about 80 million children you know, die in the womb or die at stillbirth, which means they don't get to, bat they don't get to be baptized. And my mother, for I lost two children, my, my mother lost two children, uh, in, at a stage when they could not be baptized, they were miscarriages. So, and here's what our church teaches. For until the, until literally the last few decades, it was the case that the church thought they probably, probably went to hell. They had invented, theologians invented a place called limbo because increasingly it was intolerable 
to teach that innocent little babies went to hell. Why did they go to hell? Because they still had the stain of original sin, and which baptism alone can take away. So that was the teaching. Little by little, it was, it was finessed by this fiction called Limbo, which, of course, the church ditched a few years ago, saying we never, we, you know, it was never church never, teaching. We never taught that. It was no. never church teaching. <laughs> anyway, so, right. Um, and, then, and then we had the International Theological Commission, which looked at this whole question and said, well, what we can say is that we don't know what happens. We don't know what the fate of these babies is. We leave them to God's mercy. Good I said, idea. what do you mean you don't know? <laughs> what do you mean you don't know? Salvation is the business of the church. The one thing they should know, absolutely know is, is this God we believe in big enough to embrace these little ones that he created and say, okay, you weren't baptized, but you know what? Welcome to heaven, folks, rather than the possibility of hell. All right, Mary, you're moving. But that's what you get. I'm afraid that is what you get when you get a bunch of celibate males <laughs> constituting the magisterium. Which is only going to be uh, They've never worse, lost Mary. a baby. They don't know. Can you imagine the hurt to women and men who'd lost those babies? Just imagine the hurt and the guilt and the awful feelings Oh my God, I mean, it's unbearable, but when you don't have the experience, you know, and like I say, rules about us without us. Yep. Okay, Mary, here's your next question. <clears throat> I have a funny feeling that I know the answer to this one. Uh, Mary, have, have women and minorities made it in the church? There's a very, very short answer to that, <laughs> which is no, but change is coming. Um, okay. because if it doesn't come, then the church is going. So that's as simple as that. That's right. That's my girl. Mm -hmm. That's my girl. Mm -hmm. That's my girl. Mm -hmm. But they're not, th let, let's put it this way. Uh, we're, we're at a, a, a highly transitional moment in, um, in modern society and in human development. You, you can't look at the cosmos now the way you did in second grade on those posters. No. You have to now make room for uh, the god of science who also created whatever it else is out there. So the whole theological foundation is shaking without it. It's been there for a long time, remember that. Uh, it, it, they made a mess in Galileo but they admitted, as time went on, that Galileo was right, along with that entire stream. So once you say right, right, to that particular image of the, of the cosmic world, you are, in, you are in a period of questions that is overwhelming because none of them, no matter what answer you were given in the past, it doesn't completely su suffice in the present. Right. Mm -hmm. So women are not the only minority from the, uh, uh, the, the, the silhouettes of Christianity or of humanity in the church. Um, there are other minorities. Uh, you have the, the entire LGBTQ uh, community, and they are coming on strong and clear. You, you have the, the transgenderism. And I must admit, you know, I, I have moments just walking down a street where I say to myself, I, I, I see parents working with small children, and it's perfectly clear, and the, these children are being allowed to grow up and grow through and grow in and grow out, and they don't necessarily get called a tomboy at the age of eight or something. It's it's part of the of the the of the development. But now we have a church that is pronouncing on minorities, meaning as they've always pronounced on women, women are simply inferior, face it. Mm. Just you have to face it or you can't face it. And if you can't face it, you find yourself in, locked into uh, a, a negative position you never intended to be in. 
he never got up in the morning and say, I, 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 I simply will not accept that. It was so unbelievable you were sure it was wrong. Mm. Or that at a certain age you would grow out of it. Now, what will it take? What will it take for the church to get beyond the theology of maleness? It's a theology of domination. Mm. It starts immediately and it is, it is now being pursued in, at every atom of it. Women like you, I know these, the women in this audience, I know where it ends. And they say that's wrong, that's but, wrong. But what, it, how, how can it, you have yeah. that theology? Wasn't it embedded though in every aspect of civic life as, and secular life as well as church life? Um, so, I mean, I, I grew up through a time, I, I, I'm Chancellor of Trinity College in Dublin, 400 year old university, and um, at the turn of the 20th century, uh, one of the great intellectuals of uh, Ireland at the time was the Chancellor of Trinity, was the Provost of Trinity, the boss in Trinity, and uh, he, he were, women of course were not permitted um, into the college at the time. And he was asked, uh, there was a, a movement towards bringing women in, and he said that over his dead body would they get into Trinity, and, and, and if they did, they would be a danger to the men. Uh, now, in fairness to him, he was probably right about that. I give him that. I give him that. Um, mainly on account of as soon as they got in, because shortly after he died, they did get in. And so he was also right about over his dead body. And so once they got in, and that burgeoning ability started to be tested and measured in the same way as men and, and soared and came through. And I think of the first women lawyers um, who came through in around 1918, 1918, who came to the bar, who won every prize. All the prizes, um, they outstripped the men. They had to be better than them then. Why? Because it was the only way they'd ever have got through the system. They had to be outstanding. And they probably also had to be doggedly determined to win at all costs, and they did. So they were the trailblazers. And I, mean, I think back, you know, women were not admitted to, to degrees in the University of Cambridge until the 1940s, the 1940s, I, seriously. And so we are in many ways in the opening chapters of the breaking down of that architecture of sexism and misogyny that infected virtually every institution, every workplace, every school. It's not that long ago in the 1970s in Ireland, up until the 1970s, if you were a woman in a public service job, or in a bank, for example, on marriage, you had to give up that job. So that's not that desperately long ago. Uh, it's not so long ago we were just discussing the whole question of wearing the, you know, of um, young Muslim women wearing the headscarf. I remember as a teenager going to do the shopping and with my mother and my grandmother and my grandmother lifting, uh, putting on her hat, my mother putting on her scarf and me putting on our scarf because normatively we wore, we wore head coverings. Now I don't know when that all went, but I know by the time I got to university at the end of the 60s that was all gone. So um, we, were, we are in the process of dismantling. Um, this, this infrastructure, this architecture that is centuries, ages old. And uh, the church, unfortunately, doesn't have within it yet um, a sufficiently robust critiquing structure, can I put it as gently as that, um, that, uh, that allows change to happen organically and spontaneously. Um, in the case of universities, in the case of workplaces, helped by really good scholarship and very good legislation, we started to measure women in the workplace. We started to measure um, women going up the ranks of jobs. We were able to present evidence. And confronted by that evidence, governments legislated. Uh, we had all sorts of schemes. I remember when I went to, Trin I was, um, when I went to work in um, Queen's University in Belfast in the 1980s and um, subsequently became uh, pro-vice chancellor there. Um, one of the first two, two things hit my desk the minute I went through the door. One was um, an outside agency, the Fair Employment Commission, which uh, reported 
that um, there were not enough Catholics in the university. And then we got one from the Equal Opportunities Commission that said we didn't have enough women in the university. And one of my jobs then was we formed a team which took all our staff, 3,000 members of staff, and put them through a training scheme where we, all of us, including myself, confronted the baggage, the prejudices, all the, 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 the perceptions that were skewed that allowed us, when we sat in interview boards, to keep replicating what was wrong and allowed us to open up our minds to other possibilities so that very quickly, incident, very, very quickly, the numbers of Catholics started to go up. What happened with the number of women? No, it was the, the robustness of the, the absolute embedded robustness of the opposition to women remained so much stronger. And I kind of figured it out. This is my thought, this is my own kind of very unacademic approach to it was that the difference, the Catholic Protestant thing only went back as far as the Reformation. So we only had to deal with four or 500 years of history. Whereas the embedded sexism and misogyny went back thousands of years and was much more deeply embedded than any of us imagined. Um, now that has all begun to change. I was in law school in the 19, late 1960s, early 70s, and um, there were very few women in my year. I think there were about 10 of us out of 60. Now you go into a law school, you'd be lucky to find, you know, in a hundred, a class of a hundred, you'd be lucky to find 30 men. Um, it's, they're completely, and these are the high achieving, you know, to get into law school, to get into medical school, you've really got to be a top, you know, top performer in the matric matriculation, and the girls, of course, are, are really there. And so that's all working its way through the system. But it's the church remains resistant to it because it hasn't got, it's created this hermetically sealed male celibate um, structure that is a citadel um, that you can't, and it's a citadel which resents internal critiquing. I mean, I speak, if I speak from outside, I'm regarded, you two, I'm sure you've had, you know, we're regarded as absurd, subversive, that's mild, shrill, if we dare to, we're shrill. Um, shrill. And, um, you know, we, um, we, we, we talk in, you know, in really harsh terms. I mean, I remember uh, back in 2018 when I was banned from the Vatican, which was the best thing they ever did for me, because um, the conference that I was to go to was a kind of absolutely nothing conference. Nobody ever, you know, bothered, you know, taking any notice of it. But because I was banned, suddenly there was this great big, you know, fanfare. And, uh, but uh, it gave me a tremendous opportunity to say things that I said 30 years ago that nobody noticed, but apparently became, um, were, were trending on Twitter and Google when I described the exclusion, the theological exclusion of women from the priesthood as codology dressed up as theology. And uh, because I refuse to deal with it as serious theology, because it's not. You know, it's the same old bogus hoo-ha that kept women out of being doctors, women yeah. from being lawyers, right. women from being all the things they couldn't be until they became them and showed that they're perfectly capable of being them. Um, and it's the same, you know, it's the same with priesthood. And, um, but to be perfectly frank, um, I'm not so worried about that. I think that'll die under its own dead weight, the same as Galileo's exclusion did. It'll, you know, the church has an awful habit of backing itself into ridiculous corners, painting itself into stupid corners, and then over a period of time kind of slinking quietly out of them. Not all of them are Galileo moments. Yeah. They slink out of a lot of stuff. Limbo's a classic example. They slink out of them. And so they'll slink out of this one eventually. Um, and if there's any women left, there will be applause. Um, but there may not be. There may not be, because you try, I mean, I have, I have two daughters and a son. They're young, they're, they used to be, um, you know, they, they used to be mass going, um, faithful kids. Um, and now their, their attitude is, mom, are you still, do you still bother with that stuff? Why do you bother? Um, they've, they've moved on. Yeah. And so it seems, to, and here's the thing that just hit me when my kids said it to me. When I was growing up, the church, I'm talking here about the governance of the church, the priest, the bishops, that whole structure. And I was taught to be very respectful and very deferential. You know, you kissed the, the bishop's ring and you were, you know, you, you ran and you got a, you know, a, a, a nice comfortable chair for the priest who was visiting the house, all of that. But my kids said a very important thing to me. When they were growing up 
we had started in Ireland, as you did, in, as happened in Canada and the United States and elsewhere, commissions of inquiry into the behavior of priests and bishops in relation to both physical and sexual abuse of children in institutions run by the church and also in one-off um, situations with priests particularly. And these were, these were commissions of inquiry which were government sponsored and they were dealing with information that had to be dragged out of the church. It was not voluntarily offered and none of these commissions were initiated by the church. Things are slightly different now, um, these years later. And as they said to me, Mum, when we were growing up, the church authorities that you used to be so respectful of, they were always under investigation and they were always found wanting. That's a different experience. That's a completely different experience from, so they're growing up with cynicism, with skepticism, righteous skepticism. They're also growing up with tools that we didn't really have growing up but were the advantage of education. I, I was very lucky, I grew up when, um, as I was growing up, the government in Northern Ireland had introduced free second level education, so I was a beneficiary of that. My mum and dad weren't, they left school at 14 and 15, and they would love to have had an education, but anyway, it didn't happen. But they wanted it for their kids, and we were lucky that we got it, thank God, and, and mercy nuns, thank you God, because they were the people who massified the schools, along with the Christian brothers, and yes, there was at times a, you know, a tough side to it, but there was also the opportunity side to it, which really, um, uh, Seamus Heaney puts it, puts it brilliantly in his poem from the Canton of Expectation. He describes uh, the, this sh huge rush from the massified second level now into massified third level and into the professions, um, which was a, a big, 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 big step for the Catholic community. But he describes my generation as having intelligences brightened and unmannerly as crowbars. <laughs> I just think on that, I think it's a brilliant expression. And, but what we were learning was, we, our intelligence was going to be applied like a crowbar to the obstacles that we would meet, the obstacles to Catholics, the obstacles to women. And we would use intellect, we wouldn't use, you know, the default of, of violence or the default of just, you know, wallowing in cynicism, we would get organized, we would measure, we would research, we would confront. For example, when I remember writing to the, Arch to the Cardinal, Archbishop of Dublin O'Connell, when I was trying to understand the exclusion of women from priesthood. And he, I asked him, could you just tell me, what should I read about this that will inform me? And he told me to read a book, I don't know if you've ever read it, by a man called Manfred Hauke on women, the theology of why women are excluded from priesthood. Such unadulterated garbage I've never read in all my life. And I'm reading it thinking, dear God, if I got this in a university, you know, as a master's thesis, I'd, I'd send it back and say, you know, this is a fail, you know, or a, like a, a G minus. It was so awful. I mean, things like, saying things like, you know, well, women's voices are lighter than men's. <laughs> the man never met my mother, you know, or my granny. <laughs> rubbish, absolute rubbish. Now, in fairness to Manfred Hauke, in fairness to him, if you then go to someone like, um, when I was going into law school in 1969, the, the, the top book on my reading list was by an Anglican very, very senior jurist, Glanville Williams, who, um, and we were told uh, by the university that this book, we should have it read before we started our law studies, and it was called Learning the Law. And there was a whole chapter in it called Women. And I remember seeing this chapter, Women, and I looked for the chapter, Men, of course, there's no chapter called Men, no, 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 no. But the chapter on Women starts off saying, I don't mean to be ungallant. And then it starts, he doesn't understand why women are even bothering to go to law school, we're not fit for law school, we're not fit to become lawyers. And really, you know, and our voices are light, you know, Pache, Manfred Hauke. Um, and on top of that, um, the only thing he can say in our defense is that if we go to law school, 
we will meet a good class of potential husband. <laughs> there there yeah, for you now. Yeah. That's why I married a dentist for pure spite. Um, I mean, so that kind of nonsense was normative. It was accepted. When I, I remember the first time I was about 15 when I told our local parish priest that I was going to be a, that I wanted to be a lawyer. And instantly he said to me, oh, you can't, two reasons, one, you're a woman, and secondly, nobody belonging to you is in the law. And my mother, who normally, you know, when priests were in the house, which was a regular occurrence, you know, she would be tripping over herself and ringing bells and kissing hens. And, um, and in that moment, my mother gave me the only piece of career advice either she or my father ever gave me, which was, she said to him, you, she said, out. And to me, she said, you don't listen to him. Actually, she was rather more crude than that, but that's more or less what she said. Um, that, that is the perfect way, you know? Yeah. This is, uh, Mary, believe it or not, in these three minutes, this, this conversation has ended. No, it, seriously? Yes, yeah, seriously. Aww. We are even over time. Are we? So, wow. Yeah. So I'll be short. Uh, I'll ask you a, a lot. I, have you noticed uh, the, that uh, article that's going around? I, I only found it about three days ago, which tells you how behind I was in this kind of work. Uh, on, it's something about the women the women who could lead the church. Oh, it's Joanne Moorhead's yeah, article in the okay. tablet. I, I it's the women it who the could but are not I, allowed. I, I didn't see it and I didn't You were mentioned it. in dispatches in it. I heard two days ago that, yeah. and so were you. Yeah. So I've decided that I'm with a woman leader of the church, and, uh, and she's over time. So this is what <laughs> I want to know. Since you can't talk to me about all that stuff yet, let's assume that that this night falls on intelligent ears and men rush to telephones to, to uh, a, a identify you as a great leader for whatever work they're in. And I, this is what I want to know. In the church, whatever church work, if you were designated as a church leader tomorrow by Rome, what three things would you do immediately? End the prohibition on women priests, include LGBTIQ consciousness in our understanding of human sexuality, and dismantle clericalism. Dismantle <laughs> clericalism. Okay. That's it. That's the whole deal. Right there. Mary, did you pick up any, any questions? We'll only take four. If there's anybody, in other words, in the audience, we didn't want to try to collect a lot of papers, and we know many of you are of one mind to begin with. If, uh, if four of you in this audience say, I, I'll, if I don't get to ask this question, I'm going to blow that building up before I leave, <laughs> please go to a microphone, and, and we will entertain that question and three others. Anybody. Oh, and the fourth thing I'd do is get rid of Humanae Vitae in relation to artificial contraception. That's the other thing, yeah. So, but I think we've already done that anyway, haven't we? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Go ahead. Hello, and thank you. Um, it seems to me that where your conversation began and where your conversation ended looped around very, very well. Um, the message I took away is that participatory democracy uh, requires us to ask some uncomfortable questions uh, and my question is this for those of us who are called to teach who have this vocation that you share with the number of the members of our community um, I'm not certain if it's this way in Ireland but many of the students who come to us uh, have been discouraged from asking difficult questions um, and and from uh, discovering their own faith discovering their own answers so do you have advice for those of us who are teaching as to how we can foster that ethos uh, in our students of this generation? I think that's probably the most important thing you can foster is the questioning, discerning mind. Um, no matter how difficult the question or no matter how silly the question, 
to encourage it. Uh, just picture this um, at, you know, at, at a point where I was entitled almost to a free bus pass in Ireland because of being a senior citizen. I enroll in a pontifical university in Rome uh, to do a licentiate in canon law. And the first thing I am told in that class, you are not allowed to ask questions. Now, my Italian wasn't great at that time. <laughs> And so I thought, no, nah, that can't be right. So what did I do? <laughs> I was literally decapitated verbally um, and told, you've just been told that you're not allowed to ask questions. And I said, well, with respect, now that I know that I actually did hear the question right, I'd just like to say to you, what self-respecting teacher does not encourage the students to ask a question? That's all I'm saying. I, I want to so. add something to that. I heard you use the word, it gets discouraging, just to try. To, and, and I tell you, any, any institution in transition is always mm. uh, caught in the vacuum of nothingness. We all knew the way this thing operated before, and we did it. We, we know what we want, and we don't know if it's coming. What the big question is, what happens to the faith in the interim? And my suggestion is that you continue to do what you do so well. You must create intentional communities of the heart and the mind. Find your, find your, um, t find your own respected thinkers. The people that when you go out for a beer on Friday nights and, and, a, and a conversation comes up, you don't have to worry about there being a fight. You can discuss uh, things of the heart, things of the spirit, things of morality, things of, of uh, political leadership. You can discuss them with some people. That respectful language is basic. But most of all, I'm not, so, I'm not assuming that you'll be in a group where your language is not respectful. I'm saying help one another move to the next level of understanding and commitment of the soul. It may not be in the structures yet, but when you know in here it's right, then you are the seed of the new church. Yep. That's you understand sure. what I'm saying? Yeah. For sure. And it's important that you Absolutely. find those groups and those people and that you, you use this, you need, K-N-E-A-D, the soul for the future because the population has to be there who knows the direction to which the church must go. Yeah. Next question. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you so much for your words. Wonderful to have you here. Quick, simple question. I'm kind of a, a visual learner. And when we toured Trinity College and went through the library about five years ago, amazing, beautiful place. Really enjoyed reading the history of some of the different busts of all the folks that were there. And I remember running through trying to find a bust of a female leader and I didn't find one in the whole library at Trinity College. Has there been a commission started to put your bust in the library? And, and if not, can we start one tonight? Actually, we have taken steps, and it's nothing to do with my bust, but to, uh, to remedy that, we have just had um, a, a focus kind of um, event where we invited nominations for exactly that, the celebration of women in the college, so that has gone ahead. But funnily enough, in my old university, my old alma mater of, of Queen's University, um, a few years ago, I was invited back, when I was, became president, I was invited back to open a women's conference and into the, what we call the Great Hall. And it's just a congregation of portraits. And I pointed out that at this women's conference, we were now surrounded by female portraits. And the only female presence on those portraits was the female dog on the knee of a former professor. And I pointed out in this university, which you know had been a Protestant establishment in its day, um, that it was founded by Queen Victoria. And I knew that there was a portrait of her 
not too far from where I was talking, but it was stuck in a cupboard. And I mean, I am no, you know, I, I'm a, an Irish nationalist. I'm, I'm not a monarchist. I have huge respect for the, the, the British monarchy, particularly for the present um, uh, Her Majesty the Queen, Queen Elizabeth. But I was offended that the very, you know, foundress of the college, that a beautiful portrait of her had been just stuck in a, in a room, in a, in a cu cu cupboard, and nobody thought to take it out, dress it down, and put it on a wall. She's there now, and she's on the wall now, along with four or five senior, including myself, a terrible portrait of me. My mother said, where's your portrait? As she stood looking at it. Um, <coughs> <laughs> so um, th there you have um, an example of the work that needs to be done, because you know, it's a question of what are we looking for you know, when we celebrate? And if our minds are always drawn to celebration of the male, the greatness of, you know, uh, then we need to re-educate our, we need re our perception and our perspectives need a fairly significant degree of re-education. That's what we're about here, really, isn't it? Yeah, uh, yes. And we need a certain, we, you know what, we need a certain level of patience with that. We yes. also need a certain level of impatience. Yes, we do. So kind of that, that tension between patience and impatience. Well, that, that's, why, that's why I'm asking people Thank to you. join in discussion groups, to find the group that, where you can take your soul and, and hear where, how other people have grown in it. It is hard, uh, very difficult, almost impossible to maintain a faith that is faith rather than simply practice without coming to new consciousness in your own soul for why you're doing what you're doing and how it affects the world around you. You are the seers. You are not the observer. You are not here to listen to other people. You are here to carry the faith. And when the faith <coughs> is not being carried as it should be carried by the institution, it is not all the institution's fault. It's our fault. Somehow or other, you must take your doubts, find their direction, Thank God for the new awareness in your own life, and you must make that church real. So it's no use coming to yeah. a conversation. Absolutely. When the church, <coughs> the church is the people of God, the church meant it. Absolutely. That's the story. And the church for the last 70 years has been trying to tell the church what the church wanted the church to be. That was Vatican II. And then the episcopacy got between <coughs> the council and the people. And everything stopped cold. Your pope is asking you to make Vatican II come. It's all about you. It is not about them. And that's why you're here tonight. And that's what I want you to take out that you, you are here picking up seeds. Now spread them. Mm, that's great. If you want it, spread it. Anybody? Well done. Yes. Well if um, Doctor, uh, um, if I could ask you to put on your hat of being in government. Um, congratulations, first of all, to Ireland that's had two women as presidents. Mm -hmm. um, in looking at the current situation in Europe, and we have some women in presidencies in Norway and so on. Do you see women making more impact in Europe in their positions uh, than are offered here in the United States in terms of affecting their countries and the values? I, I take a particular view on that subject, having lived through Margaret Thatcher's tenure as Prime Minister of Britain. And I, the view that I take is, um, I want to see more and more women coming through, I want to see more and more women in politics, I want to see more and more women's views and voices. But what I will not do is impose on women um, a kind of a one-size-fits-all. I think, unfortunately, the um, current pope and previous popes 
have tended when talking about women to talk about them in terms of their nurturing qualities, as if we all have the same basket of gifts and qualities. I think equality demands that we accept when women get to the top, however they get to the top, or if they get a job, however they get that job, that we accept them as they are. Now, we might, I would easily battle with Margaret Thatcher if she were alive today, but I w I'm on the one hand glad that someone like her got to the top. I would have preferred if somebody different from her had got to the top, but, but when we want when we want women to come through, I don't think we have the right to impose on them um, the necessity that they have, um, if you like, gifts and talents that are essentially peculiar to women. Because um, I'm not sure that that isn't also part of a kind of a patriarchal, kind of patronizing thing in a way. But what I do think is if you only talk, if, if you know, God gave us two wings, if we insist on only using one, we're going to flap around, you know, in, in, we're, we're never gonna get height, we're never gonna get direction, we're never gonna get velocity because we're only using the one wing. And that's why we need the uplift of all the women, all their giftedness, uh, whatever their perspective. In my, um, I think of, and I mentioned Margaret Thatcher because God knows, um, in our, my family have reason to be grateful to her. My father was in an explosion, a bomb, um, um, in which a young woman died and uh, the b bomb was directed at him. It was supposed to kill him. Didn't, and anyway, it killed a young woman. And my father went, because of her death, he thought that she had just fainted. Um, he went to lift her up. She was, she was crossing the street. And anyway, she, this car bomb had exploded and a piece of shrapnel, actually a car key had broken her neck and she was now dead and he went into a state of catatonic depression for quite a number of years. So he would sit in the house, listening to a small transistor radio, but communicating with nobody, and just sighing, which was really quite difficult, because he'd been a very vibrant person up to that. And then I came home from university one day, and my mother said to me, you're not gonna believe this, she said, but your father started talking again today. And I said, God, that's fantastic, what did he say? He said, shut up, you old bitch. I said, what? I said, what? He said that to you? She said, no, no, no. He said it to some woman called Margaret Thatcher on the radio. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we call that the miracle of Maggie Thatcher. <laughs> and it just proves the point that, you know, all the giftedness of women can dock in all sorts of different ways. <laughs> I don't even know what she said. Go ahead, I, I have a kind of a micro level question that goes with your talking about discussions and really talking with people. When you get, and I'm sure this has happened with both of you, I'm a woman in tech, once in a while I run into a misogynist who challenges my technical abilities. How do I keep the love one another and talk to this person or defend myself without getting down to that level? I'm sure this has happened to both of you a zillion times as amazing women in male worlds. And I just wondered, how well, do you keep I, yourself? I've, I've, and I've done a lot of, of, of study on difficult communications, and I know what you're talking about, and I understand what Mary presented to us so clearly in, in, uh, in respectful language. But there, there, is, there is another moment in, in the communication uh, process that is without conversation but as impacting as if it were brilliant conversation, and that is this. When I find myself embroiled or face to face with, a, with a, a, a person that I know we can't possibly at this moment, maybe over time, we would develop a relationship and the conversation would be a good one. Uh, but at the same time, I have a conscience problem. And I, I sat with somebody within the last 10 days a professional in the city who, uh, who was talking about the, the, the changing elements of weather and people and said this to me, sitting in a chair across the office. He said, um, and of course, uh, in the middle of that, we had COVID 
And, and then uh, they wanted us to wear masks, and I was happy to refuse because I don't want people telling me what to do. Now, that's, that's a, a good portion of a, the American society at this moment, and I know that. And this is a, a, a brief touch. I'm not going to sit with this man. It's not going to be a long conversation. We are not going to be meeting twice a month. He's there, and he's a young man. And furthermore, he's in the medical community. He's in the medical community. He's working with people three feet away from him. And he won't put a mask on because he doesn't want to be have anybody tell him. What I, it, I found it so ironic. I, I had to keep un, unfolding this thing in my head. In a situation like that, I always do the same thing. I say, well, that of course is your position, but I think in all honesty, I have to tell you, I think differently than that. I think differently than that. I use it everywhere. I, 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 come, I, I came to my conclusion differently than that. Now, what does that do? It stops the tank in the middle of the road. I'm not shooting anything at the tank. I have no intention of, uh, of uh, harassing it in any way. All I need to do at that time is to assert my conscience, not my power, not my force, not my dislike, not my uh, rejection, my conscience. I think differently about that. That will almost always, unless the person is, is goading you to some kind of anger, uh, the, the, what you are making known is that that position is not universal and that that person may want to rethink it because someone else thinks very differently. And I saw the look on his face, and I saw him stop in his short, and I smiled, thanked him for being there, <laughs> and was happy I was there. He's a fine young man, but he's not thinking as far. And, and if he is thinking, and he's come to an honest conclusion, then by all means, live in it. That's all right. But I don't want to be told what to do is not a sufficient answer for Joan Chittister to absorb. So <laughs> I think <different. laughs> now, my, 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 dear, my dear friends and neighbors, we began this evening with uh, some poor Sufi uh, looking for his treasure where there was more light. And then we heard, uh, we heard Chardin tell us that the only act that is worthy of our effort is to construct the future. Tonight is not about your past. It's not even about the present. It is about your future. And what you take out of here is a piece of this, this little society's future. You have a huge moral responsibility when you come into a scene like this, you are not forgiven the right to do nothing. Now, here's my proof of that. Um, I, I, heard, I heard a story years ago about uh, a warrior in full armor that was racing his big white horse through this dark forest and copses of trees. And all of a sudden, there in the middle of the road, is a little sparrow lying on her back with her legs straight up in the air. And the warrior pulls the horse in and says, a Sparrow, what are you doing? And she said, uh, I, I, they tell me that the sky is falling in. And the warrior says, oh, yeah. And I suppose you think you're going to hold it up on those skinny little legs. And the sparrow said, well, sir, one does what one can. <laughs> Please go and do what you can. You're the cutest sparrows I've ever seen. We'll, go. we'll just leave that. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you.
So thank you for coming. Thank you for being willing to be challenged, inspired, and I want to say we are so grateful for the good humor. Good night. <laughs>